please rise. Court is now in session. All rise. All rise. Is it legal to a regular look at the legal system and you, a special production of Missouri Bar? I'm Bob Pretty. And I'm Farah Fight. Back in my reporting days, I spent decades covering the Missouri legislature, and I, I watched it writing the laws or trying to write the laws under which we all live. And Farah, I, I know that in your years as a staff member of the state senate, you saw that lawmaking was really hard work. Yes, and there were a lot of late nights during filibusters, I recall. Mm -hmm. Writing the law is difficult because the wording has to be so exact that the proposed law covers only the issue under consideration and does not have some unintended consequences, or is written so broadly it can be interpreted in so many different ways that actually interfere with the justice being done. Now, we're recording this edition of Is It Legal 2 at the annual meeting of the Missouri Bar, and our two guests are speaking at the main session on the issue of legal innovation. Please introduce our folks who will be talking about the steps that are being taken to make the legal process easier to understand. That Bob. Our guests today are Ayub Ajmi and Nicole Fisher. Ayub is the Director of Legal Innovation and Technology at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Law. Go Roos. Right. Yeah. He helped build and deploy innovative solutions such as the Virtual Self-Help Clinic and the Kansas Protection Order Portal. We'll get into a longer description a little later on that. Nicole, who founded her own firm here in Kansas City, which has like bright lights with her firm name on top of it, works exclusively on family law litigation. She's a former federal public defender in Las Vegas, but was drawn back to the Midwest and in 2011 founded her own law firm. She's a past chair of the Missouri Bar Young Lawyer section. Two of you sound just like the kind of people we want for these programs, folks who understand the intricacies of the law and can explain it in language that people like me can understand. And so that's what we're going to be trying to do today. Is, is that a way to explain some of what you do? Absolutely. I mean, you said the key word, which is plain language. Why is that innovative? Innovation, a lot of people, when they talk about innovation, the first thing that comes in mind is technology. And the reality is innovation can be anything. Anything that could help or streamline a process, it's innovation. Uh, making a legalese, a form that is full of legalese in plain language it's innovation. Uh, creating a guided interview is innovation. Changing the process is innovation. So innovation takes a lot of places. Technology is just one piece. It's my specialty, but I always want to remind people that you too can innovate. You don't have to be a programmer or computer science major to innovate. You know, three, three of my reporters have become lawyers. And they, said, they all said the first thing they had to do was learn how to write differently. Yeah. So are you kind of reverse engineering some stuff here? I, th I think so, yeah. It's kind of hard because, uh, like, I teach legal technology and students, you know, they're trying to do the opposite of what other <laughs> faculty are trying to do, which is, yes, it's good that you understand the language and the lingo, but if you really, whatever you are doing is for the general public or public who are representing themselves in court, you really have to be at that level. And it does. it's, ha it's not really has to do with education, it's like when you get a contract and then you don't understand what's in it and you just sign it. and Or it's, it's a law now. A public, uh, in, uh, 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 public documents has to be written in plain language. Websites has to be written in plain language. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's more popular. So I don't think lawyers or, or students think of it that way anymore. So they understand the necessity of writing something that anybody can understand. In your practice, you spend a lot of time interpreting the law for the people you deal with. Correct. And so I always try to keep in mind, and I always say this to all of our associates, is we don't have corporate clients. That's not who we're serving. We're serving the everyday person. And so just like when you go to your doctor, you don't know all the, all the terms that they're going to use for you there. Please use terms that people understand. Put it at a surface level that they understand what's going on. And I think it takes away a lot of their fear of the process. And that, yes, we write in this way, but a lot of times when I write emails, I write in a very different way. You practice in family law, which is probably the area of law that most people have interaction with when they have a legal issue. Um, how important is it for there to be, I guess, clarity and ease of understanding when you have complicated or dissolutions of marriage or child custody agreements? Well, I think that that's honestly what separates some family law attorneys from others is that can you come down and talk to the average person going through 
maybe one of the most traumatic experiences they've ever been through? Can you provide the empathy with the clarity and make them feel confident that they're being taken care of? And if, in my experience, if I'm talking like a lawyer, like I would to another lawyer, that's not happening. They need me to talk very differently. And that gives them so much more ease and trust in the whole system. Is that the biggest challenge lawyers face it is, is translating the law to their clients? I mean, there's a lot of complications you guys have, but is that one of the big deal, well, biggest think, deals you have? When you well, work? I guess it depends. I mean, it depends who you are working with. Of course, if, if I'm assuming if lawyers were talking to each other mm-hmm. or in a professional setting in the courtroom, they don't really need to go to that plain language level. But uh, when you are dealing with the public and, and like I said, self-represented litigants, I think it's necessary. Sometimes you may even need to have a different language altogether, not just plain English. So, so that's that's really the reality. I mean, when it comes to the users of the court, especially in civil litigation, that's a, that's those are the issues they they talk about. Like we did surveys of the courts, and then we asked court clerks and judges of what are the issues that people are facing. And three things always comes to mind. They need forms, they need assurances, and they need to understand the law. Always, everywhere. So I did the survey in Kansas, I did it in Nevada, and there are I, I, I research other jurisdictions. It's always those three. Um, so I think it's just fair. So if I'm going to pay for service, at least I understand what's going on. So in so many things, as a consumer, I can kind of like sign in, interact online, maybe never even need to speak to a person. I can have maybe an autofill, my name, address, some of the basic information. And then there's a series of questions that'll collect the information. It does a lot of, it feels like it takes a lot of the pressure and work off of me other than entering the right information. Mm -hmm. Um, How does the legal industry compare to other industries and this type of ease of use? I feel like we're kind of dinosaurs, to be honest. I think that we're very behind. I think that's for a number of different reasons. One being that lawyers are extremely busy. They're completely stressed out. And to think that they're going to make all the court deadlines, make all their clients happy, and then on the side, make all these innovations in their practice, they're just not that interested in it. I will say, you know, I represent a broad base of people. Some people are very tech savvy, and I try to kind of evaluate those people that I'm like, they will love the portal we have. That's great. But then I also have people that I'm like, oh, this portal is going to freak them out. And they're just trying to put one foot in front of the other. They don't even know how to scan a PDF. So that's one of the things I'm doing an intake. And then I kind of make a note to my paralegal, like this person's far more into portals. And I think it'll be, they'll love it because they can always see what's going on in their case. This person doesn't even know how to make a PDF. So email is a stretch for them. So I think that especially when you're representing real people every day, you kind of have to be cognizant of where they are at for their technology advances. Yeah, I think, I think again, the, the need is huge of people who need help, people who need legal help. And it's not like they can't afford it. Sometimes it, there is no help. There is not enough attorneys in certain areas or in certain practice areas to help uh, or the time you need them or pandemic, for example, or something like that. So there has to be other ways of interacting with the court and accessing the justice system. Having portals and having technology is one way. We should use any solution we can to make uh, justice accessible to the majority of people. We've had some past episodes where we've um, we actually have done two episodes on expungement law and how it's been expanded mm-hmm. over recent years. And I know one of the elements in that statute was um, a form that was supposed to be you could be able to create it and ideally mm-hmm. submit it w- without the assistance of a lawyer if you chose not to work mm-hmm. with a lawyer on those expungements. We've done two or three past episodes on elements that have been created through statute that have been aimed at making court elements very accessible to the public and hopefully very easy. One is expungement, and the idea there was that an uh, individual who's seeking expungement would have a form they could fill out and not even necessarily need the aid of a lawyer to do so. 
Um, the same with orders of protection. Um, but yet in the episode where we talked there, they described that uh, still today that most people who want to fill out an order, order of protection are going to the courthouse, going to the circuit clerk's office, filling out you know a paper form where they're checking boxes. What are some ways that innovation uh, can improve these processes? And, and do you have some examples to share? Absolutely. I mean, those are two examples that I'm, I'm very familiar with. Uh, so let's start with the expungement. So the law, the, the, ch- the most recent change of the law in 2019, it became more accessible. But then we learned quickly at UMKC School of Law, because we have an expungement clinic, uh, that it's not that easy when it comes to uh, going through the process of checking someone's eligibility to expungement. It requires doing background check. Uh, our hope was that we can automate that. We can have it online so uh, people can do it on their own because the reality is petition-based is not going to be enough. It's going to take hundreds of years to do it one by one. So we had the, you have to have automation. And unfortunately, like in Missouri, it's not possible at this time because when you need to look at someone, uh, criminal records, you can't just look in CaseNet, for example. You have to look everywhere, and those systems are not connected so there is really no way to automate in that. That's why I always say, well, technology is not always the solution. Like we have the technology and we have the resources to build the tool. It's not going to work because there is no way to know if someone has municipal offenses. You have to go to the municipality to, to research that. Uh, for protection order, I, I listened to the, to the episode and it's good, but it's not good enough. We can do better. The reason is, if I remember correctly, you still have to go to court to file for protection order. Or sometimes, I, I'm not really sure about Missouri, but I know in some jurisdiction, I think uh, I remember a study in uh, North Carolina where they have this beautiful system that you can do file for protection order uh, online, but you have to go to a shelter and an advocate in the shelter will fill, it, fill the form for you. That much sounds may have sounded like a good idea at that time, but then COVID hit, and how I'm going to reach the shelter? Or what if I'm in an abusive relationship and I can't leave the home? So there is so many obstacles that it's a good solution, but it's not good enough. And then when you look at all the resources we have now, when you look how you interact, how you use technology to buy stuff that show up from a different continent in three days, mm-hmm. Or how you can be date someone in in minutes and using an app. Well, why is it so hard, so easy to date someone, and it's super hard to file protection order against someone you are dating, for example? So, like again, in in Missouri, uh, Kansas City School of Law, UMKC School of Law, we were privileged to participate in a project with Kansas where we help them design and build a protection order portal. This is a court uh, project. They own that system. And that's, for me, the perfect example because it's it's a portal that gives you uh, a solution for a specific area of the law that is a huge need, and it's an A to Z solution. So basically, if today, if someone... Uh, even thinking about protection order, they have a place online where they can go, they can learn about their their rights, and they learn about the difficulties of filing and, and the danger sometime. So they learn the resources available next to them by typing their zip code, for example. And then if they decide to file protection order, they can do it from the same website. They can first start with an eligibility that tells them which form they need to file, and then they can file it. And on top of that, they can electronically send it to the court. That's that's a full solution. And that's what I, I wish we have that for every area of the law in every state. Because like the success of that project, thanks to the, the buy-in of the court and the judges and the clerks, it's saving lives. And then... And I always want to remind uh, people that, yes, we are doing it to the users, but there are other people who are benefiting from this system. Judges are benefiting from this system. They don't have to get applications that are wrong or handwritten material that they can't read. Uh, Clerks are happy with the system because they don't have to spend their day telling people which form they need to fill out. And in some jurisdictions, they are not even allowed to do that. 
So everybody is limited in what advice they can provide. Yeah, they can't give legal advice. That's considered legal advice in some jurisdiction. So everybody is, is winning from this solution. So again, we did our research before we started the project. And then from what the clerks and the judges told us, on average, someone who is filing for protection from abuse with children, they spend eight hours in the courtroom trying to fill out the papers. There are almost 45 pages that you need to fill out. Wow. One of them is very famous. is the affidavit, uh, uh, UCCJEA affidavit, which is super hard to fill out if you have kids. You have to give information about every child for the last five years. It takes hours to, to just get that right. Uh, so now, on average, it's 45 minutes. To Wait, do... can you repeat that again? So before... Eight hours to 45 minutes? Yes. So the okay. process in the past used to take certain uh, victims who have children eight hours. And then imagine someone who is in trauma, who is in an emergency situation, in a courtroom, probably on the floor, trying to figure out what paper to fig- file and maybe children running around. And then now where they can do it from their own smartphone, from their home, and it takes 45 minutes. And then it takes two minutes and a half to determine your eligibility, which means rather than going to the court and asking someone which form should, just an example, in Kansas, there are two type of protection order, PFA and PFS, protection from abuse when you have a relationship, and protection from stalking or, or sexual harassment that does not require a relationship. This is like the simple explanation. People don't know that the difference. And I'm not saying like people like because they don't know the law. Even law students in our clinics, we gave them the forms and they can't tell which one they need to fill out because it's really hard and they look exactly the same. Uh, so with this tool that we created, it's simple Questions, yes and no, yes and no. It takes two minutes and a half to determine exactly what you can file or if there is another relief that is better for you. Nicole, it sounds like you've been describing what to a layman almost sounds like do-it-yourself law in many ways. From your standpoint, from your practice, where where is the line supposed to be between do-it-yourself law and when you actually need somebody like an attorney to do this for you? Well, I think that can be really hard because even though they can file the order of protection themselves, sometimes going to court, they don't know the, the procedure of it. They don't understand that certain elements have to be met for the judge to determine that like there needs to be a PFA or a PFS. I've had clients that have gone to court and they felt that they were in danger, but they didn't actually say that. And so when you have a lawyer, they know to hit a good lawyer knows to hit those elements and the judge goes, okay, we've now hit the elements. So I still think that there, when you are in a litigious situation, I still think that there's still a place for lawyers and for the training of that. But I completely agree that there is a place for, especially with domestic violence. You know, I have clients that can't come to my office and they beg me to meet them in a parking lot somewhere because if we're at the grocery store, then their abuser thinks they're at the grocery store. If they come to my office or they turn off their location, they know that they're at a lawyer's office. So I think it is vital for domestic violence to have these options available because I hear it all the time. Like, I literally can't come to your office. I can't go to the courthouse. Will you please meet me somewhere that if he's, he being stereotypical, if he is tracking me, I'm at the grocery store. But then they still need you in court. We've heard so much about artificial intelligence and chat GPT and how it can ease and and speed up innovation in so many industries. Why should the average system maybe not opt to ask one of these myriad of online platforms to try to write their own legal briefs and legal forms for them? Are there pros and cons to, to trying it? I have used ChatGPT to write a speech for my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. It was beautiful. It was amazing. Way better than what I could have done on my own. Loved it. Now, to did write it make a, them tear up? It did. It absolutely <laughs> did. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. I struggle with it in the legal context. I'm still open to it, but I still think that there's a lot of misinformation out there. I would not rely on it to write a petition or an answer 
or to write a legal brief at this point. But I do think as it gets better and better, um, I was at a CLE a couple weeks ago where one attorney was advocating for you not to understand this would be malpractice at some point. Is there any concern of the lack of confidentiality? So if you're putting in information that maybe would typically be a closed court record, but you're putting it in, you know, online for this to be part of, is there a chance that that information could be, you know, divulged elsewhere that you wouldn't have control over it? Yeah. I mean, I think the way, the easy way to look at it uh, is AI is just one of many advances in technology. It's not going to stop of what we see now. It will be improved. It will be other technologies will be available. And you attorneys or regular uh, people using the court should use the same caution and best practices as with any tool. It's like confidentiality. I mean, it's the same as sending password by email, for example. Or is the same as putting personal information in social media. It's, it's, I, don't, I personally don't see the difference. It's you have to know, like for attorneys, I teach a legal technology competency course because that's one of the requirements. You have to be competent and you have to understand how technology works. So unfortunately, a lot of uh, jurisdictions, except maybe three or four, who require the CLE every year to be in technology. In Missouri, for example, it's just, you know, lawyers need to be abreast of technology. It's very broad, not very specific, and you don't really have to do any CLE about it. And like Nicole said, I mean, it's, it's, you can't really, I mean, looking at young attorneys who graduating soon or recently graduated, you really, I, I don't know how you can function without understanding those tools. So let's go back to your question about AI specifically. There are many solutions out there, and some of them are just maybe not what they say they are providing, maybe not good enough. But when it comes to enterprise software, software where you know who's the creator, you know who is the the host of the content, those are professional enterprise softwares. Like, for example, Microsoft they have Microsoft Azure, which is a protected environment. And right now they have a chatbot that is out of the box that can look at your own information on your own PDFs and it's closed. So it's not connected to the internet. The information that you upload, it's not used to train the AI models and nobody else will have access to that information. I don't think anything more secure than that. And then you can use it internally like a knowledge base for your associates to look up the law. Or you can create like your own chatbot for specific area where your customers can ask questions and you can control what the answers should be. You can add citations. It's pretty advanced and it's amazingly simple to deploy. I think the for me, the benefits of AI way better than the risk. And the risk could be mitigated by educate education and best practices. And it's not going to stop. We're always going to have issues. It happens to large corporations and they get hacked or run somewhere. We just have to adapt and the fear should not stop us from innovating, basically. You know, I think the first time I ever ran, ran across this issue in terms of the Internet was many years ago when we started seeing commercials for uh, Write Your Own Will. Has has that gotten better through the years because of innovations in, in handling the law, and especially with IT and, and, and inter- artificial intelligence? In my practice, no. If anything, a lot of times, whatever they find <clears throat> on the internet, whether they paid for a kit, they did whatever, they go to court and the judge goes, I can't accept this. Like, this does not comply with this local rule. And I think we figured out it takes 17 forms in Jackson County to get divorced. Wow. And so the judge like, I can't, like, this doesn't work. And now, as of July 1, you have to redact. The judge can't tell you what you need to redact. You're supposed to figure it out on your own. Well, attorneys are having a hard time figuring that out. And so, I, if anything, you know, when all those kids started coming out, I remember attorneys freaking out. Like, this is going to take away our business. 
if anything, I feel like it drives people to lawyers because they go to court one time and the judge is like, this isn't going to work. Then they come in with these pleadings. And then we have to amend them all to make them right and then go to court. So if anything, I feel like it's it almost drives people to lawyers. So yeah. maybe what my dad used to always tell me, if you're going to do something, do it right the first time. Go ahead and pick up the phone or I guess not just a phone. You can email or probably even text a, a law firm now. Well, and that's why... My firm started Drama Free Divorce, and it's supposed to be affordable legal services that are flat fee, and it's really for people that have already decided how they want to divide things. Because I've heard this from judges over and over again, especially on the uncontested docket, that these people come before them, and they really are done. They And they know exactly what they want, but the judge is like, I can't write all this for you. And they've gotten this like toolbox or whatever they found online. It's not right. And so... I found that I thought there was a big need in the community for its flat fee. This is exactly what you get, and we're going to get you through the process, and we're going to get you divorced. So should we just skip this Internet stuff altogether? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think something that we have to also address is that, like when we talk about those solutions, the idea is not to replace attorneys. Mm-hmm. It's like any other... Of course, maybe some will have to adjust and change the way... They do their work or maybe they change the way they, they bill. But the reality is there is always going to be a need for, for attorneys. At the same time, the, there is a, a huge number of population who they can't afford lawyers. They can't be accepted by legal services because they make a little bit more than the threshold. And they are kind of in the middle. They can't get representation, and they and they and they don't qualify for free representation. So what are they supposed to do? So what happened is, like, thirty eight percent of them decide not to do anything, and then the majority of them, they will do it on their own, and then when they do it on their own, they are against an opposing party who have a lawyer, and it's just slow the process. Because they make mistakes, mm-hmm. and it it's, it doesn't work to anybody, so it's it's not gonna you, probably the person who is gonna use a do-it-yourself tool, they are not gonna be your customers anyway because they either can't afford you, or because they they know what they are doing and they know a little bit. They need a little bit of help. Mm-hmm. I mean, not everything has to go through a lawyer. So some stuff people can do it on their own. I had I saw it, I seen it every day in the library, where people come and get the forms and and it's good enough for them. With the advances that we're seeing, what are some ways that aren't necessarily relying on technology, but that we can still be innovative and improve the delivery of legal services? Well, I think COVID honestly accelerated a lot of it. Before COVID, the only county that I practiced in that would let you submit my affidavit was Jackson County. And by that, I mean, you didn't have to go to court to have your final divorce hearing, which for some people, it's it's an expensive morning. They got to take off work. They got to find childcare or, and they're paying their lawyer a lot of money to just basically put something on the record that we could have just put an affidavit. And I saw over COVID, a lot of counties that I thought they'll never change because that's just how they've always done it. They all started changing. And so I think that is one great way that each county in Missouri can make legal services more um, more available to the everyday person by allowing people to get divorced by affidavit. We don't have to go to court for everything. Well, that's an interesting point. Can you give me three or four examples of things that happened during COVID that improved this whole innovation process that COVID made the system more yeah. innovative. Put it on the bullet train instead I mean, of the There the is so engine. many. Yeah. There is so many. And every time I think about it, I said, well, this is really doesn't make any sense. How come, like just yesterday, you said this is not possible. And now you say it's fine. And then four years later, it's still fine. Well, one example is video conferencing for talking to your customers or talking to, uh, attending hearings, uh, WebEx and Zoom and other video platforms are heavily used by courts, and they are not going anywhere. And I think I don't I don't even know if they were available before COVID. <laughs> and then other things is which is really what I would love to see progress in is basically courts changing certain rules. 
that that could facilitate things like that. One example is in protection order, there was this, I, f I can't remember the name exactly, but there is a form that you had to notarize. And because of COVID, notarization was not possible, so they waived that. So like simple things like that. And um, again, forms, for example, when it comes to the description of the abuse in the protection order, in the past, the form has like one field which says, describe what happened. And then you have to figure out how to say it. Well, that form now has changed. And then instead of saying, describe what happened and let you figure out, they ask you, can you say the date of the first incident, the location, and then describe what happened? And then the date of the second or the worst incident. So it kind of giving you a little bit of help. So those are small changes that doesn't really change anything doesn't really impact much but the on the other side it makes makes access uh, justice more accessible missouri's courts have been very focused for decades on making sure that our courts remain open as per our constitution um is there a little bit of a double-edged sword to that because several years ago through casenet um they launched track my case where you can you, you know your clients or anyone with matters before the court can go in and get like pings like an email or I think even a text message saying like hey there's been another step or a change or something filed with your case and then with expanded remote public access which uh, took effect here in 2023 um, it means that not just the kind of docket information is available on CaseNet, but the case files associated that are public court records, um, not protected by law in other ways, are now available, not just to the parties, but to everybody. What are the, I guess, benefits, but also challenges that come with so much information readily available to those involved in the system and those watching from afar? I think especially in family law, there's been some unintended consequences. And I'm not saying that maybe didn't think it through, but it now, I was talking with an attorney last week about it, and she was estimating that it has caused an extra $1,500 on every case to redact stuff. I will say in my own workflow, like I was so used to having things drafted for myself, I'd go in, tweak a couple things, upload it, and I'm done. Well, now it has to go back to a paralegal, and they have to redact. And so it's causing a clog on the uncontested docket right now because judges are going, I can't accept this. It's not redacted. And people look at them and go, what does that mean? And there's really hasn't been, in my opinion, enough guidance on what exactly needs to be redacted, what is considered confidential information. At the same time, they're trying to balance people having access to justice. Again, in divorce law, I'm not a huge fan of that anyone can look up their neighbor's divorce. I don't like that. There's just some sensitive things that are put in the pleadings that I just don't think need to be available for everyone. The other side of this is that you could have always gone to the courthouse and gotten this pleading. So you could, if you really want it, you can go get it. Uh, me personally, I'm not a huge fan of this new rule because I think it's costing people more money and I'm not really sure that we need all that information out there. Yeah, I think I agree with you 100%. Um, my example is with the protection order portal when we we were first researching the what are our options one of the questions that we received was that this is can be problematic because it's going to make filing so easy that everybody going to be filing protection against people they don't like i mean the concern was that it was going to be overused or maybe abused. yes abused exactly that didn't happen so f almost four years now that's not the case because, like Nicole said, if someone wants to do it, they can do it with the old way, paper and filing by paper. It's the same thing I feel like with with the with the remote access. Um, I don't think someone just because the files are now somehow easily accessible that people are going to start looking up other people' information, divorce information, and probably those who need who want that information. They can do it with this rule or without this rule, even before they have ways to do it. But I'm also concerned about the redaction issue, especially from the self-help litigant perspective, which is, uh, for me, I can. this is impossible now to do. So at the UMKC Law School, we have self-help clinic, which is a collaboration with Legal Aid of Western Missouri. And then we do um, limited scope representation, 
and we have volunteer attorneys who are uh, judges who meet with uh, meet with clients again using Zoom and remote uh, and tools. Just for our, lim- our listeners, limited scope means that attorney might review your paperwork or briefings, exactly. but they don't actually go to court with you on appeal. Hundred okay. percent. So basically, I'm your attorney for the duration of this meeting, and then once this meeting ends, we don't have a relationship. So that's what what I mean. And then it, often those s- small claim cases and minor issues, they they ended up with a form or something that they need to file. Well, now it's becoming really hard. I mean, not just figuring out what to redact. The process itself, there is two forms that you need now you need to add. And how are you going to redact them? You're going to redact them by Sharpie. Do you know that there is a famous case, I think it was Samsung or some of the electronic uh, uh, companies where they redacted some papers using Sharpie. And then if you scan that Sharpie, you can change the contrast and you can see the text underneath. So redaction has to be done in a professional way using professional dedicated software that does redaction. So it's not going to be accessible to regular people who use the court. And those are probably... Who knows what's going to happen? I mean, uh, maybe they are not going to redact their social security number or personal information. I feel like this is a step, one step forward and two step backward. So it's, yeah, the challenges of balancing the goals of the greater legal and justice system with the rights of the individual, it sounds like. Yeah. This, this, this situation has been developing for a long time. Uh, and there's a lot of documents that are out there in that early that now need to be redacted uh, for long-term protection of people. Uh, you can't go back and ask your clients to pay you to redact to, to correct these problems, can you? Well, from what I understand is that they can't go back in time. So it's everything that's filed after um, July 1 is what's on the table. And then yeah. every county is being rolled out at different times. So you don't, I mean, I think my county is like November or something, but... But we had to start doing it July 1. So mm-hmm. that's my understanding is that we don't need to go back mm-hmm. in time. Those things will still have a higher level of security on CaseNet. But going forward, you need to, even if your county isn't available right now today, you need to start redacting immediately. Everything before July 1, 2023, you still yeah. got to go to the courthouse to get. <laughs> yeah. 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 As you're talking about legal education, uh, are you satisfied that lawyers who are going through the law schools now, are they proper being properly prepared for the, the ongoing and on-developing innovations that will have to come? Are they, are they being prepared to be ready for that? I, I believe so. I can guarantee, can, um, with my school at least, yeah. we are doing the best we could, we, and we have been doing this for many years. This is one of the things that drove me into this field. When I was hired, which is uh, 10 years ago now, I was hired as a librarian. I did not have a JD. I had no interest in legal field. I'm originally from Morocco, and I won a lottery to come to this beautiful country. Mm -hmm. So I don't even understand the legal field when I came here. It's different than where I come from. And then working with the faculty at UMKC and looking at all those uh, projects they do for the community and um, interdisciplinary projects and all of that, it got me really interested. And I have technology background. And I, for me, it's just no-brainer. Technology and the law, you can make, you can change lives uh, in a huge number. Like, for example, the, the protection order portal, we have over 20,000 petitions done. If I had to do it by myself, I would probably never reach 20,000 petition in three years. So uh, it's just the use of technology can have huge impact, and that's how I got interested. And now I'm teaching legal technology courses. I'm t- teaching interdisciplinary courses. When we started, the numbers were, for example, in my summer class, I had maybe 10 or 12 students. In the last two years, it like three times more. So there is uh, uh, evidence that students are interested and they understand that technology is not like um, before where it's uh, um, more of a uh, productivity tool and you need to understand how to use Microsoft tools, for example. 
technology now, like what Nicole is doing, is used to provide a new service that didn't exist before. Uh, that's how technology can can help. And then if you are a law student and you are thinking that once you graduate, you can, the work is going to be the same as it was before, maybe. But for the majority, it's going to be ch- it's going to be changing. So you have to to equip yourself with some new skills to be ready for for practice, basically. But the young students now are coming out of a climate where they're accustomed to change technologically all the time. So does that make it easier for them to be in a state of mind to feed into the system? I think yes and no. I, I've had, I went to UMKC, mm-hmm. love that law school, great job. Um, I have younger associates where I literally had to say to one a couple weeks ago, I don't have paper files, you don't either. You're getting paper files from the file cabinet because I did not realize that we still had them here. Once they're gone, they're gone. Like, I will not order any more for you. So I still think that there is still kind of a reliance, especially for lawyers, with paper, and I need this, and I need that. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it'll transform over time. I think that students that went to law school during the pandemic maybe, you know, weren't exposed as much to as much technology because there weren't as many opportunities to clerk. So I think the last thing a lot of law firms were doing was bringing in extra people when we're all working in shifts as it was. Um, But I'm hopeful that over time it'll get better and better. But I still see even really young associates that they have like paper anxiety. They just want their paper. I don't know. It makes me feel like it gives it like more formality or something to it. Correct. Well, I mean, I'm an old timer, so I I like to have a real book in my hand. Mm -hmm. I don't like to read tablets. That's the kind of thing you're running into. Yeah, so like at our firm, I hate legal notepads because I feel like you can lose them. I remember when I was a young associate, I'd spend an hour or two every week just trying to organize all my notes from all my phone calls, all my court appearances. So everyone at our firm has an iPad. You write your notes on it and you just upload it into the file. That has been like a concept that people are, they still struggle with. And I'm like, I'm not buying any more legal pads. So (laughs) figure it out. Only clients get legal pads. That's it. And while it seems that that is efficient for you and your associates, does that also benefit the client? I think so, because then it's in the file. It's on a paper file. So then the paralegal can go see the phone call that I had and what was discussed or what happened in court. There's not this gap in, well, did you file the notes? Do I have to go to the file room and look at the notes? You know, if the client calls in, they can go to the attorney note section and all my notes are there. Searchability. Yeah. Is big, huge, a vital change. Come, let me let me ask you a question. Coming out of my background as, as a guy who watched the laws being written in the legislature as a reporter, how does how can innovation help legislators do a better job of writing the laws to begin with? That's a good question. That's a good question. Okay, I you know, well I don't have an answer. Yeah. I mean, I guess again to go back to my first point, which is. We can skip technology and let's just do with what we have, and then let's innovate in in the laws. When laws are written, why are we? Who? Are, what are we trying to do? And is this outcome, the law as it passes, is it gonna uh, respond to the need that we have? So I think again, innovation can take many places. Uh, I like to introduce design and design thinking, and basically the idea is, let's before we jump into a solution let's sit down and use papers or use whiteboards or use a computer and let's just put our ideas on one place and then figure out why are we here and who are we trying what are we trying to do and then that ha- that helps helps it helps in a lot of fields i don't know why it would not help in legal field uh, it just makes everyone uh, on board you understand what's going on there is transparency and then hopefully the solution that you can come up with, at least you know that it's going to fix certain problems. What is the biggest impression that you believe the public has about the legal system that you think innovations can correct or well, improve? Yeah, I mean, like I mentioned, the surveys we do, and that's what the you, the public are saying. I mean, for example, they need transparency. Not transparency, but... They need assurances. So when you are in a stressful situation, and especially when you are dealing with forms that you don't understand, you always have that feeling that it's like 
it's like you want to check that what you did is right and then you didn't miss anything because you know that if you do it something could happen you're going to lose a case or at least your case will be delayed and things like that so those can be easily fixed i mean not easily but there are solutions out there like there are notification systems there are for example you get a confirmation that 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 your paper has been filed or before you even file your file will your file will not be generated if you did not answer certain questions for example if for example we are doing a guided interview well you can't submit until you fill out all the required fields so those are simple tools that create that assurances and then at the end you say you have done uh, your petition and it's ready now to be filed and you will get an email confirmation when it's done so those are few simple things that can help with making the public at ease with the process and then another thing is uh, education and, and learning it really doesn't cost anything i mean course are already doing that they're already having flyers they're already having websites and and you can take that to a chatbot for example and then have that to be uh, automated you can create explainer videos for example which two minutes video explaining simple concepts people like when like nicole said earlier when they go to a hearing it's hard to prepare for hearing and sometimes you don't know what to say and you may not say the things that you have to you need to say so of course now are using videos to prepare um, the the public for the hearing preparing them to basic steps things like where you need to sit what do you need to dress how you need to present yourself simple things like that can help tremendously any suggestions as well, Nicole? Oh, I completely agree. I think that a lot of times people are extremely nervous. They always want to know, where sh what should I wear? Where will I meet you? And they have an attorney guiding them through the process. I can't imagine not having an attorney guide you through that. So I think it's, I know that there's pro se classes that they've started, but also I, I completely agree with just having two minute tutorials of this is how you act when you go to court. This is what you wear when you go to court. I've seen it happen where people walk into court and they're completely inappropriately dressed and they realize it right when they walk through those doors. And they, you can just feel the discomfort. And I'm like, oh, if someone would have just told them. So I, I completely agree. I want to ask you about a couple of specific things sure. that I read in your, in, in, in your listing of qualifications, if you will. One is the, uh, the virtual self-help clinic. Clinic, yeah. Tell me how that works and how that plugs into the legal innovation system. Absolutely. When I was hired by UMKC, we had more librarians than we have now. And then we had librarians who some of them were paralegal before, so they were very comfortable in giving legal advice to some limit uh, or at least helping people find forms or uh, how to go to courts and things like that. Unfortunately, the, the, we don't have as many librarians as we used to, and even our hours were cut off. So the, the UMKC Law Library is publicly accessible, so we have a lot of people from the public who are sent by the course because they don't have a, a library there for the public to come to our library to get help. So we get a lot of uh, resources that are dedicated to the public. And when we couldn't do that anymore because we of staffing shortages, uh, the previous dean, Dean Glessner finds she discussed the possibility of bringing volunteer attorneys and judges who want to continue serving on their own time. And then we created this program with uh, Legal Aid of Western Missouri, where we have uh, Mondays and Wednesdays from 10 to 2 p.m. We have attorney one or two who are available to help people. This is, was in 2000, beginning of 2019, I believe. And then it was working very well. We had people come. We had some issues, limitations and times and expectations and things like that. But then when COVID hit, I received an email from the person in charge and she said, well, I think we just have to shut down the, the clinic for now until we figure out what to do. And I told her, well, give me, give me a week. Let me, let me think about what we can do here. And then we, with me and my colleagues, we drafted like a plan where we will move the clinic to virtual, to be virtual, using again Zoom and other tools and intake forms, and that's what we did. So we built an intake form where people can um, answer a few questions, so we know what what they need help with, 
and then we can do some triage and, and move them around and things like that. And then when we know that we are ready to represent them, we have a scheduling platform where they can pick a time where they can meet in Zoom or by phone if they like to. And then we do a Zoom call with them. And then if we need to send them documents, we send them by email or whatever. Uh, and that's how we did it. Well, the thing is, again, that was like a plan B because we didn't really want to, you know, at that time, there's a lot of people who needed help. And most places were, were on lockdown. So we really wanted to provide something to help. Well, th- what happened is um, we doubled the number of people we could help just by going remote. And instead of being available from Monday Monday for four hours and Wednesday for four hours, we are available at any time that turn is volunteer available. And instead of having like four volunteers, we have now 12 volunteer judges and attorneys. So it's just by just doing this small change, we, we triple the number or double the number of people that we can help. And we are still, they still like it. The attorneys, they like it because they don't have to come to the, to, to, to the office. And, and do you, the, the public like it because, unfortunately, our public parking is not free, for example. Or they may not have transportation. And they don't have to come here. They can call. They can zoom in. If they can't come, most of them will call and say, hey, can I move my meetings? And we move them. And another thing which is very important, our volunteer attorneys and judges, they... They don't know what cases they are going to be helping. And sometimes they don't have the expertise needed. And then we have to reschedule. Well, now, because we have the triage system, we match them with people who they know that they can help them. And it's just, those are, I'm not, this is not like some invention. We basically use an email, an online form, and Zoom. That's it. Nicole, does this, does this kind of thing dovetail into anything that you're doing or does it does it help the kind of people that you deal with a lot i mean before covid it was unheard of for us to do a initial intake over the phone no one was comfortable with that it was just no if they can't make time to come in here we're not doing it and then our whole attitude just changed um and that you know i can do this over zoom i can do this over the phone and you know for some of our high-end clients they prefer that because they're like i'm a surgeon I do not have time to come to your office and do that. And we'd never thought about that before COVID, but also with helping clients that need more affordable services, I can jump on a Zoom for 10 minutes and, you know, guide you through this, which before would maybe be an hour's worth of my time. You know, also with the court going more virtual, especially because I also practice in Johnson County, Kansas. You know, we used to have to go to the courthouse for these 15-minute status review conferences. Well, they've gone completely virtual unless it's really an evidentiary hearing. And we just hop on Zoom, we, we all talk for 10, 15 minutes, check in, and then what used to be a three hour, you know, billing your client is now 15 minutes. And I always felt terrible about how we were billing before, but it was still my time and I was like, this is what I'm selling, but it really only was 15 minutes of FaceTime to get this case keep moving. The other thing I wanted to ask you about was, was the Kansas Protection Order Portal. Uh, we have a program in Missouri that, that was set up by Secretary of State Robin Carnahan back in 2007 called, uh, what are they? Safe oh, at Home. Be? Yeah, safe, think, safe at Home, which protects people who are involved in abusive situations from their abuser knowing where they are. Mm-hmm. And it sets up a, a separate address that isn't where they are, but it mail is funneled through to them. Is, is that what the Kansas portal is kind of like? Uh, I'm not familiar with the Missouri one, but at least for the Kansas one, when when the users and again I'm, I want to emphasize that this is a Kansas uh, mm-hmm. project, uh, a court pro- funded project, uh, and there is a lot of uh, attorneys and clerks and judges who were involved in the design of it. So we went through all those scenarios to make sure that we are not missing anything. And then when it comes to protecting addresses, there is a confidential address that that they can file. What is different than when you are doing by hand is the the error is very minimal. The risk of, of writing your address, unless you type your address when you were when you are uh, writing the narrative, there is really no chance for you doing a mistake because we you we ask you a question once. We ask you your name once. If earlier I said that the form is 45 pages, there are multiple forms that you need to fill out. Each one of them you have to write your name and address. 
So, so we ask you the same question. The same times. questions multiple times because it's on paper and every one of them has a header and case number and the whole of that. So you keep there is the risk of doing a mistake is 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 different when it's electronic because I'm going to, uh, we are only asking you for na your name once and your address once. But then on the back end, we know where to put the address. If you say that I need my uh, the the person I'm seeking protection from don't know where I am right now and I want to keep my address confidential, then if they check that box, then everywhere where the form will be shared with the opposing party, it will say confidential. So they will not know the address. And the address will be instead in the in the confidential confidential form. So those are again, those are they sound like magic, but they are very simple tools that you can apply. And then uh, like I wish we have something like that in Missouri for redaction. For example, that you don't even have to to worry about redacting your stuff because when you generate the form, it will be redacted for you. Again, it's not it's not hundred uh, percent error proof, but but it's just uh, the chances that you will do a mistake is is very minimal. Yeah, Cole, you probably deal with the Save at Home program a lot. And I actually just had an attorney join our firm who's certified in it so that she can sign up clients for Safe at Home. Um, she does a lot of order protections. Um, and I'll be honest, I didn't know that much about it until very recently. And the last signing she just had was earlier this week. And I said, I want to come in and see exactly what the process is because I know what it does. But I've never seen, like, what do you tell the client? And I will say I was very impressed by how comprehensive the program was. I didn't understand. I did not know before this that it gets down to your voter registration and that your mail is open in Jeff City and they scan it to the person. Like, I thought that they probably just bypassed it and then you have to wait even longer. Um, so when I was sitting there the other day hearing, because there's a whole script you have to tell these people and they have to initial each one of them. You have to say every word. And I had literally no idea how comprehensive the program was. And for my client who has had some very significant DV, you could just feel her just kind of go, okay, I have a new residence right now, I have an order of protection in place, and I'm not so afraid that he's going to find me. Can you think of anything, just from your brief experience, that we need to improve in Missouri on that? With the safe at home? Yeah. Honestly, I was blown away by it. I've always referred clients because you had to go to someone who was like certified in it. I'd be like, mm -hmm. you know, go to this person. Um, but now that I have someone in-house... I, and my paralegal was sitting there too. We were both looking at each other. I'm like, I had no idea it was this comprehensive. And I could just see in this client just the relief and just her taking a sigh of, and they even get down to when you order Amazon packages, you put your initials on things now, or you use a different name. They'll deliver your stuff no matter what. I mean, so they've been expanding upon it as technology has been growing, but I had never thought about that before that someone might be looking at your Amazon packages to see where you live. You know, that might be a topic for another program. So. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, do you, either of you have any ideas that are percolating that would be your next innovation that you'd love to see? Well, I'm, I'm still hoping we can get the, the expungement uh, application here in Missouri. So we are working, uh, UMKC, with the expungement clinic. We're working on a do-it-yourself expungement tool for the public where they can file... Uh, at least they can generate the expungement form on their own. Uh, there is a huge need on that. And it always reminded me how um, I was talking to someone and I always think like, okay, we are doing this because people can afford lawyers or because they don't have the mean to hire lawyers. And I was talking to someone who they said, I can pay whatever they want. The problem is I don't really know what to file. It's not really a problem of... of uh, uh, if they can afford it or not, is basically the, the law is complicated and what, how, what they need to put in form is very vague that they need help with that. So we are hoping that we can get this application ready, uh, hopefully this year, and we are planning to do some testing. Uh, other projects which I'm, I'm involved in, I'm involved with the state of Nevada, with the Supreme Court, where we are building a portal, not just for protection order, but for uh, several other areas of the law to educate people on, on certain areas of the law, providing them link to resources, and helping them generate forms and file them with the court. Excellent. Nicole, any, any next ideas that you want to implement? I would just say that um, our ethical rules, I think, need to catch up with the times. 
I know that I hit some roadblocks early on with our new firm, Drama Free Divorce, where I had to employ counsel for this, and I'm calling the Missouri Bar about this, and I'm calling the bar plan about this. And everyone was super encouraging, but they're like, yeah, we got to figure out how we're all going to comply with all these different things. And it just made me see that, especially in Missouri, our ethical rules for lawyers, I don't think have caught up with the times. I have friends that are practice. I actually practice in Nevada. They're a little bit more ahead of us. Florida's a little bit more ahead of us. And so I've, I've made friends with other law firms that are kind of trying to do what I'm doing. And I realized I was hitting a roadblock because of our ethical rules. Now, I do think I'm in compliance. Don't worry, the Missouri bar <laughs> or the bar plan. But we all had to kind of get creative and really think outside the box. And then it kind of just made me think, these just need to be revamped because times have changed. Like the, lo- the role of a lawyer has changed. You know, Farrah, this is another one of these programs we've done that has gone a completely different direction than I thought it would, and it's been terrific. Yes, in a delightful way. Yes, I, I'm glad that you both spent time with us today. Uh, are there any other tidbits about innovation that you think those listening should know, especially the non-lawyers out there? I mean, we're always trying to innovate in a way to make uh, justice accessible to as much people as we know. It's it's not easy. Sometimes it's really hard, and sometimes it's it, it takes a group. So at law school, we are always encouraging inter, interdisciplinary efforts. So we have programs where we invite attorneys, technologists, law school faculty, students, and the public to engage in our programs. Like we have the Legal Technology Lab at the UMKC School of Law. And then sometimes we need the public because when we create those tools, we are creating them for the public, and we want to make sure that whatever whatever we create works for them. So any help in that aspect will be tremendous, especially for testing services and new ideas. I would just like to end with, I really, in my heart of hearts, believe that most attorneys went to law school to help people. That is that is what got them there. That is what got them through, through years of studying. That's what gets them through the bar exam. And so I just look at legal innovation as a way that we can bring legal services to so many other people. And honestly, that's what gives me my passion to keep working is that, yes, I have clients that will pay whatever, but I also, I'm just very passionate about providing legal services to 38% of people who would never even get a lawyer. And I think that the public would be interested to know that I think most attorneys do believe that than less and that they really want to help people. That's why they went to law school. We want to thank our listeners for being with us on this edition of Is It Legal 2? And a special production of the Missouri Bar. Our thanks to Ayob Jadri and Nicole Fisher for shining a light on this part of lawmaking and interpreting that reminds us that the law is human and is not static, and the practice of it is always changing. Uh, We look forward to the next production and next program with you, Farah. Yes, thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Before we go, this program series is focusing on a lot of our basic individual rights to shed some light on the U.S. Constitution and the rights we have under it. Here's the Missouri Bar Citizenship Education Director, Tony Simons, to tell us more. If you inquire about the source of power for the courts, it is tempting to look, as we so frequently do, to the Constitution. Article 3 tells us that the federal judicial power shall be vested in a Supreme Court and all other courts that shall be created by Congress. State constitutions throughout the nation create and empower their own judiciaries. However, this is one of those instances in which an examination of the text of the Constitution is not going to be adequate to answer the question of the source of judicial power. As opposed to Article I, in which the powers of Congress are enumerated for page after page in the Constitution, and Article II, which specifies presidential powers such as commander-in-chief, appointing government officials, and negotiating treaties, Article III is quite vague. In part, That is because of the way the framers of the Constitution viewed judicial power. They saw the power of the judiciary as linked to the people's trust and confidence in the judiciary. If the people had trust in the courts, 
then the courts would have all the power they would ever need. But what shapes that confidence? Part of it lies in an understanding of how our constitutional system was designed. Part of it lies in an understanding of the special role given by the framers to the courts in preserving constitutional principles and values. This helps to explain why so many members of the bench and bar are active in civic education. The more people know about the Constitution, the more likely they are to have confidence in the work the courts do to preserve it. This is certainly a component of public confidence. However, knowledge and understanding of our constitutional system are not the sole determinant of public confidence. If a wide gap exists between what the courts were designed to do and what the courts are actually doing, then public confidence will wane and the power of the judiciary will lessen. Another aspect of public confidence is whether the legal system is addressing the needs of those who turn to that system for resolution of their disputes. The type of legal innovation described in the program today enhances the people's view of the legal system and helps to build the public confidence so vital for the court's power and authority. Some of the innovations described today provide essential information for people frequently in desperate need of help. Protection order portals, virtual self-help, and remote assistance empower people to address their legal problems. Some of the innovations presented today save members of the public valuable time from allowing divorce through affidavit, to using video conferencing instead of traveling to law offices. The example that many will find most striking is the reduction in the time necessary to obtain a protection order from 8 hours to 45 minutes. As was stated so effectively during the program, these innovations bring about a situation in which our legal system is made accessible to more and more people. Providing assistance to a greater number of people while demanding less of their time enhances the satisfaction of those who come to the legal system for help. This, in turn, enhances the credibility of the legal profession and the judiciary. And this enhanced credibility is transformed into the power and authority so vital for the courts. Those who might be inclined to see these innovations as change for change's sake should look again. These innovations are improving the lives of people and helping the judiciary to have the power needed to fulfill its role in our constitutional system. There's some resources you might want to check out if you want to explore this topic more or be connected to some of the great resources that were discussed today. Just go to MissouriLawyersHelp.org. That's all one word, MissouriLawyersHelp.org. You can find an array of information on various legal topics. This site provides information that will help you better understand the law because the more you know about the law, the better decisions you can make for your life, your family, and your finances. I'm Farah Fight. I'm Bob Pretty. We'll see you on the next edition of Is It Legal Too? Opinions and positions stated by guests and presenters in the Is It Legal To podcast are those of the guests and presenters, and not necessarily those of the Missouri Bar. This program is intended as information for lawyers and citizens of Missouri in conjunction with other research they deem necessary in the exercise of their independent judgment.